Well, today we are in part two of our series, Afraid of the Dark. Does anybody remember being a kid and being afraid of the dark? Or maybe right now you're still afraid of the dark? Um, I have a three-year-old little girl named Finley, and she will actually tell you now, I'm afraid of the dark. And she is. It's not news to me because for the last couple of months, she at some point during the night sneaks into our room and wants to sleep in our room because she's afraid of the dark. And it doesn't matter that she has a nightlight and like a whole zoo of stuffed animals in her bed. She doesn't want to be alone in the dark. So we've tried everything and have just finally resigned to just leaving out a blanket and a pillow on the floor next to our bed because we don't know what else to do. And I'm sure some of you have some great advice for us, but I just feel bad because I remember what it was like being a kid and being afraid of the dark. And the worst part of being in the dark is being alone. Because when you're alone in the dark, Every fear becomes exaggerated, every monster becomes real, and it's impossible to just relax and fall back asleep. The dark can be scary if you're all alone. I even remember being afraid of the dark as an adult. I started working at Neighborhood Church about 15 years ago, and at that time our church had just adopted Houston School. And we had started a number of ways to get to know kids and parents and partner with the parents and school staff to make life better for kids in our community. And I was loving the things that we were doing, but I wanted to form deeper friendships, like real relationships with people. And I thought the easiest way to do that would be to actually move into the neighborhood, to live next door to people and have people over for dinner and go to birthday parties and weddings and just get to know people's stories to build deep friendships. But it was a little scary to move into the neighborhood for two reasons. Number one, I was a young white girl moving into mostly Latino neighborhood, and I would stick out like a sore thumb. And number two, is as wonderful as that neighborhood is, there's also issues with crime and violence and gangs. And so it was a little scary. And everyone in my life told me not to do it. It's just not worth the risk. It's too risky. But I prayed about it for a couple of years, and after a while, I just, I really felt like this is still something I want to do. I thought the potential benefits outweighed the risks, but I didn't want to do it alone. So it took me a while, but I finally found one friend that was willing to come and be my roommate. And so we rented a house on the same street as Houston School, and we moved in. And for the first couple of years, it was scary now and then, but nothing really bad happened. And so much good happened. I mean, we had kids come over and play at our house as often as we let them. We got to know our neighbors. We had people drop off delicious Mexican food all the time. I mean, it was a wonderful place to live. And after about two years, my friend ended up getting a job in San Diego. So she moved down there, and I was left in the house alone for about a year. And it was in that year that I was home alone one night watching TV in the dark, and I heard a crash in the back bedroom. And immediately my heart started racing because no one was there except me. And so I grabbed my car keys and my phone, and I started walking down the hallway to see what the noise was. And I felt like I was in one of those horror movies when you're watching the girl walk up the stairs, and you're like, no, don't open the door. And as I got closer to that back bedroom, I started to hear more noise which is a really bad sign. And so I flipped on all the lights and I yelled, hello, as loud as I could. And then the noise stopped, which is an even worse sign. It's like, what? It's probably not a cat or something. Like, what is happening? And I didn't know if I should run away screaming or what to do. I just froze. And after what seemed like a really long time, I finally worked up enough courage to like peek into the room and I could see that a window had been broken and pushed halfway open. And then I freaked out. So I ran out of the house, got in my car, called my family. We called the police. My neighbors came over. They helped us board up the window. We did all the things and checked under every bed, every closet, everything. Everything was fine. But I was still scared. And whoever had broken the window thankfully had run off, but I was still terrified to sleep alone in this house. So I decided to sleep at my parents' house across town. So I spent a couple nights at their house, and when I was there, I started Googling all the ways to prevent break-ins. Like, what do I do to make this never happen again? And most of the things I had already done, I had an alarm system, I had locked all the doors and windows, I had done all the things. 
there's one thing that I hadn't done. See, one of the biggest ways to prevent break-ins was light. A light inside the house, lights outside the house, lights on timers, just constantly lights on whether you're there or not. That light drives away bad things. That light makes the darkness flee. That light repels darkness. And throughout the Bible, the theme of light and dark comes up a lot. And it's used to describe our human condition and also the spiritual realm. That we all experience light and dark in our lives. We all experience light, which is like hope and joy and love and peace. But we also all experience darkness, doubt, despair, grief, pain. But there's this tension between light and dark in all of our lives. There's this tension between love and hate and hope and despair. Between darkness and light, there is this battle that is happening. And sometimes when you look at our world or maybe when you just look at your own life, it can feel like the darkness is winning. The darkness is winning this battle because there's plenty of things to be afraid of in our world. I mean, even if you're not a worrier by nature, you can probably easily come up with a list of things you're afraid of. From public speaking to cancer or spiders or that meeting with your boss or the future or the economy or the war. I mean, if you just watch the news or look at social media or even just scan through Visalia Stringer, I mean, we are constantly bombarded with how dangerous our world is. Because ignorance is bliss, but awareness can be overwhelming. And pretty much if you're not anxious, you probably should be. I mean, there are so many things in our world to be afraid of. And usually when we are in fear, we naturally respond in one of four ways. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. See, for some of us, when we're afraid, our first response to the darkness is simply to fight. We go into fight mode. We are ready to use everything in our power to fight the darkness, that we push back the darkness. We try to overpower the darkness with control. We try to control the darkness. I mean, this can be as easy as buckling your seatbelt and locking your doors or keeping a baseball bat by your bed or avoiding certain places or people that we try to do everything we can to control the darkness. And for a while, it works. For a while, we are able to create this safe bubble around our lives. But inevitably, something happens that's out of our control and our bubble gets popped. A sickness, a death, a job loss, a breakup. And pretty soon we realize that we can't overpower the darkness. Which leads some of us to go to the next response to fear, which is flight. That if we can't fight it, then we try to outrun the darkness. We do everything we can to get away from the dark because it's scary. We try to run as fast as we can away from the darkness. And we do this simply by avoiding the dark. We try to stay busy, we stay active, we over-exercise, overwork. As long as we're running from it, it won't catch us. Or maybe we just simply live in denial. We deny that the darkness is even real. And we just put a positive spin on everything and God has a plan for everything and it's all going to work out, silver lining, all of that. We just live in denial that the darkness is real. Or we have reactive goodness, that we run as fast and as far away as we can from darkness, that we do everything right. And if we are good enough, if we do all the right things, then the darkness won't touch us. That if we are good enough, we can outrun the darkness. But pretty soon, somehow, the darkness catches up to us which leads many of us to just simply give up or give in. I mean, if we can't fight it or outrun it, then we just give up. We just freeze. We just stop. We give up and we get stuck. 
We don't move forward. We don't take any steps because any step forward could be a risk. And we don't want to risk anything because we've already been burned. And so instead, we cut off every opportunity, whether it's good or bad or what relationship, we just can't risk it anymore. So we just stay stuck. We freeze. We get paralyzed by fear. And when we get stuck, we have trouble making decisions. We have trouble moving forward because we just get caught in this cycle of worry and we cut off everything. But even when we try to hide from the darkness, it doesn't make the darkness go away. The darkness ends up just surrounding us and we get stuck in the darkness. Which leads to the last response to fear. And this was a new one for me. Maybe it's new for you. It's called fawn, that we just give in to the darkness then we can't fight it, so we give in to it. You often see this in prolonged abuse or trauma. That instead of fighting it, we actually become friends with the darkness. We try to please the abuser in order to survive. And you see this in abuse and it comes out later on as codependency or people pleasing, or maybe even just accepting the darkness within ourselves. And we try to convince ourselves that it's really not that bad. It's really okay. In fact, I might even like it. And if we can't overcome it and we can't outrun it and we can't change it, then we just give in to it. But in all these responses to fear, the darkness wins. The darkness wins. And it can be so hard because in all of our lives, as much as we try to do, we can all just get stuck in darkness. We can't avoid pain. We can't avoid sadness. We can't avoid grief. And in our dark world, when you look at that and really face it, it can just feel like, well, why try? Just give up. The darkness is too great. And even if you're a Christian, even if you follow Jesus, even then, even if you've done it for a long time, there'll come a time in your life where you feel like giving up, where the darkness has invaded and it feels like God's not there. That if God was there, then he should have stopped this thing from happening. I mean, if he really is king of the universe and cares about me, why didn't he stop this? Why didn't he do something? And we start to feel betrayed by God. Or that maybe he just doesn't even exist because if he did, this would not have happened. And maybe you're in that place right now or you know somebody that is where the worst has already happened and the darkness is overwhelming. Or maybe the reverse. Maybe things are going really well, but you can't enjoy it because you're waiting for the rug to get ripped out from under you. You're waiting for that future thing that's going to destroy everything and you live in fear of what might be coming. And fear starts to become our driving motivation. It starts to drive every decision that we react out of fear. And usually when we're in fear mode, we don't make very good decisions. We get lost in the fear. And it's really hard to find a way forward. Well, my husband, Paul, and I met a few years ago online, and we were living in different cities. I was living here in Visalia. He was in Camarillo on the coast. And so we decided for our first dates in person, like, let's just meet in the middle, which in the middle of here in Camarillo is nothing. It's the freeway. It's the grapevine. There's nothing in the middle. So our first date was actually at that Starbucks along the grapevine. So for our second date, Paul had talked to a friend who said, hey, there's some great hiking in those mountains. Like there's some great trails out of Lebec. So Paul told me, and we both really love hiking. So we're up for an adventure. I was like, okay, let's try it. So we meet, we go to this campground, we park, we find the trailhead easily. We start walking and pretty soon we realize that this is not like a hiking trail. It's really a mountain bike trail. And it's not just one trail, it's like thousands of trails and all these mountain bike trails over on top of each other, crisscrossing. Like it's impossible to keep track of even where the trail is because there's so many different paths. But we decided, well, let's just keep heading up. Let's just go up the mountain. We'll just follow whichever trail leads us up and then hopefully we'll get to a cool lookout. 
So we did. We walked for a while, and we got up as far as we could go, and it was a cool lookout. We looked down on the valley, and it was about sunset, so we watched the sun set over the mountains. It was gorgeous, so romantic, great second date. And then we realized it's starting to get dark. And out in Lebec in those mountains, there is nothing. There are no lights, no cities, and nothing out there. So pretty soon, it is pitch black. And we are trying to follow the trail back down the mountain to find our way out. And we don't have cell reception. We don't have GPS, nothing. But thankfully, our cell phones have flashlights. So we turn on our cell phone flashlights, and we're trying to find the trail. But even trying to find the trail, there's so many crisscrosses. Like, it was impossible to figure out even what trail would lead us back to the car and which one would lead us farther away. So this is the moment when you start to panic. We're going to be those people on the news that died in the mountains getting lost. Like, oh my gosh. But Paul, thankfully, and I have both done a lot of hiking, and we remembered that the road was parallel to the mountain range that we climbed up. So we realize as long as we keep the mountains behind us, eventually if we walk forward, we will hit the road. And once we hit the road, either it'll lead us to the car or it'll lead us back to town. But either way, eventually, might be hours, but eventually we think we will make it out of the darkness if we keep going one step forward at a time. So we just started walking not knowing if where we were going was going to lead us or how long it was going to take us. We just kept going. And thankfully, we just kept talking. I mean, this was our second date, so we're still getting to know each other. I don't remember anything that we talked about. I just was glad we kept talking because it distracted me from thinking about all the million ways that this could go wrong and how we're going to die. So we just keep walking. And then all of a sudden, Paul says, stop, stop stop, pick up your feet. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there's a snake, there's a mountain lion, like something is happening. He's like, no, 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 show me your shoe. I was like, what? He's like, lift up your shoe, show me your shoe print on the bottom of your shoe. And so I lift it up, we look at it, and then he points to the path. And the path that we're walking on has my shoe print. That we had somehow in the dark found our own footsteps. So we start jumping up and down. We're so excited, so relieved, like, oh my gosh, we're saved. That all we have to do now is follow our own footsteps and we'll get back to the car. So we start walking as fast as we can, following the footstep all the way. And then we come around this bend and in the distance I can see fires at the campground. There are families out there having campfires. Like we had finally made it. We're almost there. And for the first time, instead of looking down at the ground, I look up, and because we're out in the middle of nowhere and it is pitch black, when I look up, I saw millions of stars, like the most stars I've ever seen in my entire life, and it is gorgeous. So I tell Paul, like, Paul, stop, look up, and he looks up. I mean, we're both amazed. It is so gorgeous. There are millions and millions of stars out there, and so Paul says, well, hey, do you want to stop and like sit on this log and see if we can see a shooting star? And I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So we sit on this log and we lay back and we're looking at the sky and just waiting and talking. And then all of a sudden, we see this giant shooting star with this bright orange tail. I'm pretty sure it was a meteor or something. It was this crazy bright star and it streaked across the entire sky. This giant orange star, still one of the most miraculous things I have ever seen. And we both saw it and we're screaming like, this is amazing. This is the coolest thing ever. And if we hadn't gotten lost in the dark, we never would have seen it. If we hadn't been lost in the dark, we never would have seen this miraculous thing. Now I tell you that story Not to encourage you to go out hiking on an unknown trail in the dark and get lost on purpose. That's not a good idea. We've never been back to that trail, nor would we recommend it. There are much better ways to go and see shooting stars than getting lost in the mountains. There are lots of ways that you can go and see something miraculous. You don't have to get lost in the dark. But sometimes the darkness creeps in before you realize it. Sometimes the darkness is unavoidable, even if you're well prepared. 
Sometimes the darkness chases us, even if we're running hard away from it, it catches up. So I think there's going to be a time in all of our lives where somehow we get lost in the dark. And it's in those moments, I think, that Jesus gives us a fifth option to fear. It's not fight or flight or freeze or fawn. He gives us a different response when we're afraid. See, John was one of Jesus' closest friends, earliest followers. He walked with Jesus. He knew Jesus probably better than anyone. And John wrote this account of Jesus' life when he was an old man. And this is how he described Jesus. He said that in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness hasn't overcome it. I mean, this is a beautiful description of Jesus. But if you know John's story and what he experienced in his life, it's actually shocking that he would write something like this. Because John is an old man when he's writing this, but he knew Jesus when he was a young man. He walked with Jesus, saw Jesus teach and do miracles, and then he watched Jesus get murdered on a cross. And then as he and the other disciples, the other students of Jesus started to share about Jesus and the church grew and people became Christians, the Jews and the Roman Empire tried to wipe Christians off the face of the earth. They did everything they could to squash this new faith, which meant that John watched all of his closest friends, the other disciples, family, friends, people that he had led to faith. He watched all of them either get killed or exiled or put in prison. John also lived through the Jerusalem massacre. This is one of the most horrific events in history. The Roman Empire came down. They surrounded the city of Jerusalem with a wall. They let people starve to death for months. And then they came in and they slaughtered millions of people and then took thousands away as slaves to Rome. It was horrific and horrible. And then John, as an old man, is exiled to an island, which means he's separated from anybody he has left. And he's alone on this island. And he writes this. In the midst of all of that grief and pain and sorrow and fear, he writes that in him was life. And the darkness hasn't overcome it. I mean, for John, the worst had happened. It was not a fear. It was reality. That everything and everyone he loved was taken away from him. The darkness surrounded him, and he was alone on an island. And yet somehow he saw light. That He saw hope. That God had not abandoned him. And that the darkness wasn't winning. And I read that, and I think, how? I mean, the darkness in his life was so great. How do you still have hope? How does that work? And yes, the darkness in John's life was great. But he didn't just experience darkness. But he got to see the light of the world. That he got to see the light in the midst of all of that darkness. That he got to see the power of that light in the world. That he was a daily witness to that light, that he got to see countless miracles, people's lives transformed by God's love. And his life was definitely not pain-free, but he also had a front row seat to some of the greatest miracles of all time. See, you might be on an unknown trail right now. Maybe you've gotten lost in the dark. Maybe the darkness has crept in and you don't know which way you're supposed to go. Maybe you're thinking, I've made the biggest mistake of my life and I don't know the way out. Or maybe you've done everything right and you're still in the dark. And in the darkness, it can be easy to just look down or to just look back behind you or into a dark and unknown future and feel like the way is unclear and you feel like giving up. And I think it's in those moments that Jesus reminds us that we're not alone in the dark. 
that the light of the world walks with us through the darkness. We may not realize it because we're looking down, desperately trying not to fall, or looking for a way out so that we don't see it. But if we stop and we look up, we might get to see something that nobody else gets to see. We might see something absolutely miraculous. There are thousands of stars that God doesn't leave you in the dark, that there is always light. See, Jesus gives us a different response to fear. It's not fight, it's not flight, it's not freeze, it's not fawn. That when we are in the dark, we focus on the light. That we follow the light through the darkness. That when we are in the dark, we follow the light of the world. That we follow him through the darkness. That we don't give up hope. We keep moving forward one step at a time, believing that the light will lead us out of the dark. Because Jesus also said this. He said, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That we might have to walk through darkness, but we have the light with us, that he walks with us through the darkness, that we're never alone in the dark. There was a kid song that I learned when I was growing up. And it's kind of a weird one. It's called, We're Going on a Bear Hunt. And it's this old song, and it's this group that's going into the woods to go hunt a bear or something. And they hit all of these obstacles. And every obstacle that they encounter, the chorus goes, we can't go over it, can't go under it, can't go around it. We have to go through it. And I think that's what we have to do in the darkness. And Jesus says, you can't overcome it. You can't get into it. We can't go around it or avoid it. But I will lead you through the darkness. That if we follow the light, that he will lead us out of the dark. But he promises, if you follow me, I'm not going to abandon you. That Jesus is called a rescuer, a savior, a redeemer, a friend, a good father. And in every story in the Bible, it goes like this. Something really bad happens and people are scared and terrified. And then they see God show up and do something completely unexpected, completely miraculous that they never thought was possible. That's every story in the Bible. And no story in the Bible is everything going really well and everyone's happy and getting along and then God shows up and does a miracle. No story goes like that. In every story, it's in the darkest hour when everyone's given up hope and everything seems impossible. That's when they see God do something amazing. And sometimes I wonder, why does it have to come to that? I mean, God, why can't we see you when things are going well? Like, why can't we just be happy and see you do miracles? Like, why do you wait until the darkest hour to show up at the last minute? Why can't you rescue us and do miracles in the light? Why is it only in the dark? Like, is God just kind of dramatic? He just wants that moment or something. Well, thankfully, I don't think so. I don't think God's just being dramatic. I think actually, in fact, God is constantly moving us forward in life. That God's constantly doing miraculous things in our lives and we're just not aware of it. Kind of like a candle in the sunshine. Like we just kind of miss it. We don't see it. It's not that God isn't working in the light, but it's in the dark that his light shines the brightest. See, it's when everything gets dark, in total darkness, when it gets darker and darker and darker, and everyone leaves, all hope is gone. That's when his light shines the brightest. It's there the whole time, but when he is the only one left, the only hope we can cling to, that's when it shines the brightest. That God is with us through the light but sometimes he's the only one with us in the dark. 
But he doesn't give up hope. When everyone else leaves, he still has a redemption plan. That when things look dark and everyone else leaves and the darkness is so consuming, his light shines the brightest. And that if we follow that light, it will lead us out of the dark. See, a few nights after the break-in, I moved back into my Houston house. And I was terrified. I had trouble sleeping for months. And every time it got dark, I would get scared and I would start praying, oh, Jesus, please, like, help me be brave, but please just don't let me die tonight. And every noise I heard, I was like, this is it. This is the last night on earth. And I was terrified. In those months, I got really close to Jesus. I probably prayed more than I ever have in my entire life because I was up all night afraid of the dark. And as I prayed, the fear didn't go away. I was afraid for months. The fear didn't go away. And the danger didn't just disappear either. But I lived in that house for seven years. And in that seven years, I got to see millions of stars. I got to see so many cool things. Miracles happen in people's lives. I got to build friendships that have lasted decades. And if I had left that house when I was afraid, I would have missed it. I would have missed out on so much. And I only left that house because I met Paul and we got married and moved to Bakersfield and that's like a whole other story. But I would move back in a heartbeat because I love that neighborhood. I got to see millions of stars. I got to see God do amazing things. And if I had left when I was afraid, I might have missed it. See, sometimes it takes great risk in order to have the privilege of seeing a shooting star. That you only see God do miraculous things in the dark. He's with us all the time, but it's in those dark moments that he shows up unexpectedly and does the impossible. But even this week, as I was writing this teaching and thinking about it and praying about it, I was getting overwhelmed by the darkness. I mean, Forrest last week talked about his experience going to Colombia and seeing the devastating effects of poverty in our world. And it's just overwhelming. Or watching the news this week and just feeling completely helpless and overwhelmed that the darkness is so great. And then I go to work and I plan things like trunk or treat. And I'm thinking, what good is a bag of candy in the midst of so many dark things in our world? Like, what can a bag of candy do? And I started to feel helpless and hopeless. But as I prayed about it, Jesus started to shift my perspective. Like a bag of candy and a fun day for families and kids where they feel loved and cared for and connected, that's not nothing. That's not pointless. That all of that might feel so small, but it is not pointless because every act of love, every expression of compassion and connection and love dumps that love into the chaos in our world. And when we dump love into chaos, it changes the formula and it changes the outcome. And when we dump love into chaos, even just a little bit, it changes the whole formula and changes the future outcome. Because in communities, they're divided racially and ethnically, economically, religiously. All of those actions that divide people for generations, all of that leads to this history of hate that eventually turns into violence and darkness and fear and more hate. There's a history of hate. And yet... The opposite is true. Every small act of love, every time we build bridges and deep friendships and build connections and create opportunities for hope and joy, all of that leads not to a history of hate, but to a legacy of love. And that legacy of love over time for generations overcomes the darkness. That every action we do, 
going to work, talking to that friend, meeting a neighbor, all of those actions matter. That they all create light in our world and it's either creating a history of hate or a legacy of love. See, fear would tell us that it's just pointless. It's just a little thing. It's just a bag of candy. Who cares? It'll never overcome the darkness. And Jesus says the opposite, that every light repels the darkness around it. That every act of love repels the darkness in our world. And when lots of lights join together, it pushes back the darkness in our world. And if we focus on the light, if we focus on the light of the world and move forward step by step by step, that it pushes back the darkness because the darkness has not overcome the light of the world and that our light will repel the darkness around us. And so we don't need to be afraid of the dark because we're not alone in the dark. The light of the world walks with us. And even while we walk through darkness, we can look up and see the millions of acts of love that remind us that the light of the world is overcoming the darkness. And maybe we might even get to see something miraculous happen. Would you pray with me? God, thank you that you are the light in the darkness It can be so easy to get lost in the dark, and yet you bring light that there is never total darkness, that you lead us out of the tunnel and you create light in us, that everywhere we go, we bring light and we push back the darkness. Please fill us with light and hope this week and help us focus on you as we walk through our world. And in Jesus' name, amen.